Amen. Well, as you all know, we've seen in these last couple of months how there's been such an uncertainty in the air. It's just, it's just prevalent of funk all around because people are, are hopeless. They're, they're full of fear. Um, they're, they're full of negativity. You know, I heard a statistic the other day that the, the suicides hotline in one county, in just one county, they normally got a thousand calls. And during this pandemic, during this quarantine, they got 25,000 a month instead of 1,000 a month. So you see, people are searching. They they are, some of them unfortunately are resorting to suicide. Some are going to drugs and alcohol or prescription drugs because their whole life is turned topsy-turvy and they don't have a job or they got a cut in pay and they don't know about their future, especially all these young people who are graduating or not having a graduation and what are they going to do? Are the colleges going to be open? You know, there's just such an uncertainty in the world today, but I'm telling you, you, we have the answer. We have the answer. And I believe that as we hear the word, as we hear the word, we're going to take a stand. We're going to take a stand for right and truth. You know, I want to share with you something that I heard the other day. Pastor Faith told me about this. Jeannie Wilkerson, who was a great intercessor, she would sometimes uh, speak prophetic words at Brother Hagen's meetings. So she's gone to be with uh, Jesus just like Brother Hagen has. But one of the things she, she said, which is so true, and I want you to hear this because this is what we're dealing with. She said that public opinion is the intercession of hell. Write that down and meditate on it. You kids might not understand it just yet. But, but I, I venture to say that it's not just public opinion, it's the news is the intercession of hell because they repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat the lies over and over and over and over. And it's a st strategic plan to get you to believe because of the repetition over and over and over again. So, you know, so many Christians are drinking the Kool-Aid. They're buying into all this stuff that's happening in the world today. And they're just, they're just sitting back and saying, oh, well, it's all going to work out. You know, the Doris Day doctrine, whatever will be, will be. No, that's not the case. Too many Christians are just, are just, are just not making any decisions. They're just, they're just kind of lackadaisical. They're kind of sitting around, but now's not the time to do that. Now's not the time to do that. We have to take a stand for right and truth, for the word of God. We have to be big boy and big girl Christians. And we have to say, I'm not going to lay down under this stuff. I'm going to rise up and do what the father says. And that is be about the father's business. Amen. You know, Jesus said that when he was 12 years old and we need to be big boy and big girl Christians to realize this is our purpose. This is our plan to be about the father's business. We're not going to cave in and give in to this. Even when the, the president said, you know, go ahead and open the churches, many churches, many pastors said, no, I like online. We'll just continue online. Well, as you all know, that's in diametrically opposite of what the word of God says in Hebrews 10, 10, 25, when it says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some do, as as it gets closer and closer to the end. So we're commanded by God. These, these, these things that God tells us to do in his word are not optional. Well, I don't feel like going to church. No, 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 no. This is a commandment. This is what you do. This is what you do and we need to assemble. You know what that means? Gather together, gather together. We need to encourage one another you know, and, and, and really lift one another up. And, and, you know, this is what I heard. We went to, um, uh, the faith for freedom revival in Fort Worth this last week. And I was talking to a pastor from California and, you know, the California governor has some different rules that they're limited in the number of people that they can have in their service. And they are also restricted now to where they can't sing. They can't sing and play music. And so um, I was asking him, well, how's it going? He said, well, there are 3,000 churches that banded together in California. And they said, 
We're going to have church. We're going to have church and we're going to sing and whoever wants to come can come. And so he said, we had 80% capacity on Sunday and we're going to have, we're going to continue to have people come to the church because we're going to obey what God says. And God says, gather together. Now, let me tell you, let me just tell you this because, because the world is in such a sad state. Not the church, not this church rather. Some in the church are, as I said before, but not this church. Then, then what we have to understand is that people are ripe for the pickings. Do you understand that verbiage? <laughs> what that means is they're ready. Just like Jesus said, behold, the fields are white unto harvest. So people are ready. I heard the story the other day of a young lady who went to a riot. And she went to the riot, not to riot, but she went to minister Jesus, young girl. And she got everybody in her little group that was there, she got them all saved. Yes. See, people are looking. They're looking for answers. And the church needs to take a stand and realize that we've got the answer to a hurting and a dying world. And so we need to invite them. We need to come to or nights. We need to tell people about Jesus. We need to be on fire. Amen. So let's move on. You know, Pastor Dean talked about this Sunday that this is a diabolical plan to, to shut the church up, <laughs> to shut us up. But you understand, I go to what the master said. In Matthew 16, 18b, the second part of the verse, he was talking to Peter and he said to Peter, he said, I will build my church. And that's what Jesus is doing in the earth today. And I think we all ought to be participants in this. And that, that means come to church, do what you need to do, read the word, study the word, be a light, be the salt wherever you go. He said, I will build my church and the gate of hell will not prevail against it. Do you understand what that means? I don't care what they say. I don't care what they do. I'm going to take a stand because I'm going to stand for right and truth according to the word of God. I'm going to do the word of God. I'm going to do whatever it takes to be the light and the salt and to share Jesus with the people that we come in contact with. Amen. Will you agree with that? Amen. Amen. Glory to God. So we win. We win. We have to have that settled in our heart. We're not under the circumstances. We've talked about this before. We're not defeated. We are overcomers. That's what the word says. So I believe that even though this first six months has kind of been unsettling to a lot of people and even those in the church, but I believe that the next six months are going to be your best six months ever. You have to believe that. You have to expect that to happen because we've got the promises in the word of God. This stuff is dying. The virus is dying. They're still trying to make you wear masks. They're tr still trying to count all the testing. You know, today as I came to, to church, I saw that line a mile long of people being tested. Well, what does that mean? People aren't dying. People are, are, are getting tested who have supposedly have it. And if you've taken a flu shot in the last 10 years, you're going to test positive. So nonetheless, you know, what is that doing when the employers say you have to go take the test? Immediately for some people, that puts fear in them, right? Puts fear in them. But I just prayed for all those people. No positive cases. No positive cases. People are not dying anymore with COVID. They're not dying, but, but see, it is dying out, yes. but people are believing <laughs> the intercession from hell, the news. And so they're, they're still thinking it is spiking, but it's not. The death rate is really low. So you have to understand that we have to take a stand. We have to say, no, we're not a quitter. 
You know, the blood of Jesus covers us. The blood of Jesus covers us. We have been taught, we have been taught in this church how Jesus bore our sicknesses and carried our infirmities and by his stripes we are healed. And we have Psalm 91 to stand on that says, no disease, no plague shall come nigh our dwelling. See, you have to have faith for that. You have to rise up and say, no devil, no devil, you're not putting that stuff on me because I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. You have to take a stand on the word of God. Glory to God. You know, we've got all what it takes. First John 4, 4. If we only had that scripture, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Say that with me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Glory to God. Glory to God. Well, our, founda uh, our foundation scripture for Hupomene is found in James 1, 3. If you have your Bible, you can turn there and we'll just go over a little bit of review for Hupomene for those who weren't here last time who, who don't really understand this Greek word Hupomene. But it, what it means is the power to stand. And in James 1, 3, we know that it says... Knowing this, James is talking, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Well, in delving into the Greek, we, we see that that's expanded. It's a greater meaning in the literal Greek. But I want you to understand that the reason, the reason Pastor James, who is the pastor of the church at Jerusalem, is writing this letter is because he received inquiries from other people who had been scattered throughout the Roman Empire. You see, after Jesus went to heaven, then there was great persecution against the church. And so people were scattered. They were eaten by lions. They were cut in half. The, the Roman Empire even scattered some because of their expertise in business. So they were scattered throughout the entire Roman Empire. And for whatever period of time it was, they started writing to Pastor James and saying, look, we're, we're kind of a little bit discouraged right now. And see, many in the church are discouraged right now. But we're here today to encourage you. Just like Pastor James said, he said, listen guys, listen guys, this is what the enemy is trying to do. The, try, the enemy is trying to steal, kill, and destroy, just like John 10.10. 10. He's trying to come in. He's trying to beat you and strip you and leave you for dead. And they knew that. But he didn't end right there in his discussion in James 1. He gave them hope. He gave them hope. He said, no, this is not your end. This is not your end because you can have hupomene if you decide to have it. Hupomene is a power to stand. That's the supernatural endurance from the very throne room of God that says, no, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to cave in regardless of how heavy heavy the load is, regardless of how much the pressure is, I am going to stand. Yeah. Glory to God. And I believe I have a group of people here listening and, and here in the building that are going to do just that. We're going to stand. We're going to stand. James 1, 3 in the literal Greek says this, and it's on your paper. And I want you to meditate on that, this. It says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience in the King James. The little Greek says, no, no, no this. In other words, he's pretty emphatic. Like this is something you have to know. No, no, no this and never forget it. That the trying, which is done by the devil to get us to cave in, we know his strategies, but we're going to prove him wrong. We prove him wrong when we determine that this is not our end. We determine to prove that the word works. The word works. The trying of our faith is energized by endurance. And endurance is the power to stand, the power to not waver or shipwreck our faith or cave in glory to God. You know, and right before that, he told them, he said, you know, he said, the, count it all joy. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That's what the King James says. Why? You might think, well, that's ridiculous. Why should we happy, be happy about this? It's because we win. Yeah. 
You see, we count it all joy because what is Nehemiah 8.10? I believe it says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know, you can't sit around and be sad and depressed and downtrodden. What good does that do you? What good does that do you? You know, I have people call me and they have situations in their life and, and they're crying and boohooing. And you know, one of the first thing I say to them is quit your crying. Quit your crying. That does you no good. Crying gets you into your emotions and you can't be in faith when you're in your emotions. Do you understand that? And that's not being hard. That's saying, no, no, we're not going to put up with the devil trying to get you in your emotions when you don't need to be in your emotions. You need to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So let's grow up. You know, let's grow up. That's what I tell the kids. Quit crying, quit crying. Okay, then I can deal with you when you quit crying. But remember, we talked about this. Patience doesn't mean just sitting and waiting. Patience is two Greek words, hupo and mene. It's that hang in their power. It's I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to stay in the game. I'm going to stand. I have made a decision that I will not quit. So basically what it's saying is, I will not move until I have done and received all that Jesus said I could have and said I could do. That's pretty powerful. In James uh, 1, 4, he goes on to say, when you have endured, when you have stood, then you will be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So let me tell you, There is a light at the end of the tunnel. You're going to stand. You're not going to quit. You're not going to waver. You're not going to cave in because you're going to be strong in faith. This is why you come to church. This is why you come to church. So your faith goes to a new level every time you come and you gather together with believers who encourage you and say, don't say that. Don't say that. You can have what you say and you're saying defeat. Don't say that. So we can encourage one another and we can be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Well, today, we're going to talk about something that's called perseverance. And I know that's kind of a big word, but I want you to get this down in your heart. What this means is doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. It means doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. So, Let me just make this a good example for you children and you young people. You know, you have to take algebra or trig or whatever you used to do in school that you don't do anymore, and you kids, math, and you might say to your mom, this is hard. This is hard. I can't understand how to divide. I can't understand how to multiply fractions. I don't understand this trigonometry. Did they even have that in school anymore? Okay, I had that in college, so I was just wondering. So nonetheless, you, that might be your attitude, this is hard. Well, you know, we've taught many of our kids who come that what happens when you say, this is hard? It gets harder. It gets harder. Yeah. So as parents, we have to teach them, no, you need to persevere. You need to persevere. You know, and there are so many things that that kids do learn in school that mean nothing in the overall scheme of things. Like when you get older, like who remembers when the Civil War was? I mean, maybe Pastor Charity, she likes history, but I could have cared less. Like, I don't know those dates. You know, I don't even remember the capitals of every state in the United States. Do y'all? Does anybody know the capitals? Pastor Dean does. Pastor Dean does. He can name every capital. I got a C on that test. And I still remember third grade, I got the C because I didn't care. I don't care what the capitals are. I know that I need to know how to read and write and do arithmetic. And that's important for me. But, but you see, those kind of obstacles are going to come to you throughout your life. They're going to come throughout your life and you've got to determine, I'm going to persevere. So you've got to be faithful over those little things. You've got to be faithful over your fractions and your, your trig and, and your algebra. You've got to be faithful. Just because it's hard doesn't mean you quit. 
And if you're going to quit with your math and your reading, then you're going to quit with the bigger things of God. Do you understand that? So you have to make a decision and you have to teach your kids to persevere regardless of how difficult it is. And, and even the success is not immediately. If it is delayed, you still have to persevere down synonyms for, uh, Per persistence and perseverance is persistence is tenacity, determination, resolve, staying power, endurance, dedication, steadfastness, stick to itiveness. Let me say those over again. Synony synonyms of perseverance are persistence, tenacity. I like that word, tenacity. Determination, resolve, staying power, endurance, dedication, steadfastness, stick to itiveness. Sounds like Hupomene, doesn't it? Amen. It does. You see, when you have perseverance, you don't quit. You don't quit, you don't give up, regardless of how hard it is and regardless of how long it takes. Glory to God. Another word for perseverance is grit. It's grit. And grit, I looked it up also, it means courage. It means passion. Are y'all passionate about the word of God? Yes, you are. Passion. It means strength of character. I like that, grit. See, God's word provides the strength. God's word provides encouragement. God's word provides hope. That's why these people who are in the world and even other Christians are not having any hope because they don't have the word. And that's why we have been called for such a time as this. Every one of you that is here today has been called for such a time as this. That's why you weren't born in cowboy and Indian age. You weren't born back then. You were born now. You were here. There is a, a purpose and a plan for your life here right now. Glory to God. And it's to declare God's word. Glory to God. James 1.12 in the NIV says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. In the English Standard Version, it says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. And I would venture to say all of us have remained steadfast in these last, you know, 100 days. We're still alive. We're not dead. We've been able to do without stores. And, and many of you probably have freezers full of food that you, you bought, closets full of toilet paper and paper towel that you could probably give to some of us who could care less about that. Glory to God. But we've endured, right? We have endured. So, you know, you need to pat yourself on the back. Yeah, I made it so far. But see, the thing about it is we've got to learn to stand because this isn't the end. Do you understand? There's going to be another plague according to the word of God. There's going to be other things that we have to deal with. Well, this little one that we've had to deal with, we have decided, I believe, to be strong, to take a stand. So we will be even stronger. We won't be caught off guard for the next one because we know it's coming. But we're going to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. See, and we're going to stand together. We're going to band together. We're not going to stop forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. We're going to be here to encourage one another, to help one another, to help those that need toilet paper. We're going to give it to them. Glory to God. So it's important that we've stood the test of time and we will stand the test of time till Jesus comes back. Maranatha, I think, I think this fall, September would be a great time for him to come back, but he hasn't asked my opinion, but I would really like for him to come Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not grow weary. And see, that's what isolation does. You're by yourself. The enemy uses an idle mind. That's the devil's playground. And you begin to think wrong thoughts. And so 
Paul was telling the church at Galatia, do not, do not grow weary in well-doing because you're going to reap. We're all going to reap. We're all going to reap. In due season, you will reap, the scripture says, if you faint not, don't faint. Hebrews 10, 36 says, for you have need of steadfast patience and endurance. So he, Paul is saying, you, you need to heed this. You need to have steadfast patience and endurance so that you may perform and fully accomplish the will of God. That's what we're here for, to accomplish God's will on the earth and carry away and enjoy to the full everything that's promised in this book. Everything that's promised, health, prosperity, joy, peace, all the things that the world wants. They want what we have. And we got to tell them, we got the answer. The answer is Jesus. Matthew 24, 13 says, but he who endures to the end will be saved. He who endures to the end will be saved. Now, I want us to look at some characteristics of a persevering individual. You know, in order to have perseverance, you must have a definite purpose. You must know your why. You must know your why. That's why you have to be convinced that God is not a liar. God is not a liar. He has a good plan for your life. And you have to realize that the devil also has a plan for your life. And his is not a good plan for your life. His is a bad plan for your life. And you have a choice to follow his plan or the devil's plan. Deuteronomy 30, 19, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. You choose. And he even tells you what to choose. But see, we don't need to be stubborn. We don't need to be lazy. We don't need to lack perseverance because then we'll make the wrong choice. Amen. So we have to make the right choice. We have to believe God's word where he says all things are possible to them who believe. Glory to God. See, you have to realize that you are good stuff. You are good stuff. That, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made regardless of what mama and them said or daddy and them said or your family or your friends. You have to take a stand and say, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I don't receive all that that people have spoken over me. I'm going to believe and receive what God says about me. And he thinks I'm pretty good stuff. Glory to God. So your why is your motivator. You see, your why is your motivator. Why, your why keeps you on track. And your why is this. It's the word of God. Now think about this. People who retire, what happens when they retire for the most part? They die. You know, a lot of people do. They, why do they die? Because they no longer have a purpose. They don't have a why. See, this is why I'm trying to tell you, for you to have perseverance, the why of your life needs to be this, of the word of God. See, so many people, their why, their purpose, their, their, their reason for being in their minds is, I've got that job. I've got that job. Or think about women and, and men, it affects women more uh, when their children leave the house and move away. And it's called the empty nesters. And I know some women are looking forward to that day. I pray you don't. Because I, I pray that you, you have the resolve that my kids can stay in my house as long as they want to. That's fine with me. That's fine with me. But anyway, I think when people have an empty nest, what happens? Their whole life has been devoted to raising those children. And now the children aren't there. So what do we do? No purpose, no why. This is why I'm telling you, you can't have a why in anything but God. You can't have a why in anything, a definite purpose in anything but God and his word. Because things of the world are not going to last, you understand. So you've got to have your faith and confidence in the word of God and why you were here. 
You see? Paul's purpose was given to him on the road to Damascus, right? His purpose when he met Jesus. And so he, he regardless of his persecution that he, he endured that I'm going to talk about in a minute, he had a perseverance that he was going to fulfill his purpose. And that was what Jesus gave him to go and preach the good news of the gospel to the Gentiles. Amen. That was his why. You know what our why is? Our why is to do what the Word of God says. And I'll tell you in a minute what your why is. But at the end of Paul's ministry, you know, he wouldn't even let his emotions enter in. And this is a good example for for those women and even men who are prone to being emotional. It says in Philippians 1.23, he said, I am hard pressed between the two. My yearning desire is to depart, to be free of this world, to set forth and be with Christ, for that is far, far better. But to remain in my body is more needful and essential for your sake. So here he's telling us his flesh wants to go on and be with Jesus. And maybe that's what your flesh is telling you. (laughs) Like, let's just go on and be with Jesus right now. But see, you can't let your flesh control you because God has a plan and a purpose for you. There are people that you need to share Jesus with. There are people that you need to be the example to. And there are people that need to be received into the kingdom because of your witness. And you need to take them to heaven with you. Do you understand? So Paul, Paul got control of that. You know, he even tells us, okay, I, my flesh wants to go, but, but I need to stay here for you. And aren't we glad he stayed? Aren't we glad he stayed until his race was over? And even he told Timothy, young Timothy, his son in the faith, he said, listen, in 2 Timothy 2, 3, he said, you're going to have to endure hardness as a good soldier. In other words, you're going to have to have endurance. You're going to have to have staying power. You're going to have to have hang in there power. You're going to have, have to have perseverance just like I did. Amen. You know, Paul, Paul was persecuted. He, he, his, his time in ministry was not way, way, this is a lot of fun. Yay, yay, yay. No, he had to deal with some stuff. He had to deal with, uh, being imprisoned repeatedly. You know, most of our letters that Paul wrote, he was in prison when he wrote them. He was flogged. He was exposed to death multiple times. He had 39 lashes five times, 39 lashes on his back. He was beaten with rods. He was stoned and left for dead and even shipwrecked three times, to name a few of his persecution. (laughs) He had verbal persecution. He had physical persecution. And he had his own flesh to deal with. But, you know, he had such a strong will to know that his why was to go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And he was going to do it regardless of the load, regardless of of the difficulty, despite all the persecution, he was going to go and do what he was called to do. Glory to God. And so that's what we have to do. So at the end of his life, this is what he said in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8 in the message. I like it. In the King James, he says, I've fought a good fight. And I want that to be our our verbiage at the end of our life. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. So he persevered into the end. But in the message, it says, he's, he's talking to Timothy, and he says, you take over. I'm about to die. I'm giving my life as an offering on God's altar. This is the only race worth running. Listen to that, young people. This is the only race worth running. I've run hard right to the finish. See, that's what saddens me about rest homes, that they put people in a rest home and they have no purpose. They have no purpose, and they're just resting there until it's time to go one way or the other. 
you see. But he says, I've run hard to the finish. You have to have that resolve that you're not going to retire when it comes to the things of God. You may retire with respect to your job, but you're not going to retire with respect to the things of God. He said, all that is left now is the shouting. God's applause. Depend on it. He's an honest judge. He'll do right now only by me, but by eager, by everyone eager for his coming. So what he was saying is, I've done what I was called to do. I've finished my race. So this is what I want you to have as your mindset, that at the end of your life, you have done all that you've been called to do. Well, what have you been called to do? The first and foremost call on every one of us as believers is Matthew 28, 19 through 20. If you don't have that marked in your Bible, you need to because that's your job description. That's what you're supposed to do. That's first and foremost, that's your job. That's what you're called to do by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He told us to go into our world and preach the good news. Go tell people the good news about Jesus. In Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And then it goes on to say, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. He's with us as we go. But see, it doesn't say just go and make converts. It says go and make disciples to teach them. So that is why you have to tell people the good news about Jesus. But you have to say, hey, listen, let's have a Bible study. You come to church. We need to learn more about how to live this life. Because this is your purpose, young lady. This is your purpose, young man, to live for him. And you'll never know, those of you in this room and those watching, how to live for him if you're not reading your Bible every day. <laughs> so you got to read your Bible every day. You got to find out what you're supposed to say and what you're supposed to do. Mark 16, 15 through 20 says this. Let's put it up there. He said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Then he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. See, don't stop with verse 16. These signs shall follow them that believe, those who are believers. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. This is the master talking right before he left. He's telling you that as a believer, you need to speak in new tongues. And then they shall take up serpents and they drink any deadly thing. It shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he went up into heaven. This are his last words, the most important important words to the body of Christ. And he sat down at the right hand of the father. And then look at verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Hey, you're not alone. You're not alone. God is working with you. He is working with you. Glory to God. He will be there to help you, to lead you and guide you. Isn't that what Jesus told his disciples? He said, you go. You go and you open your mouth and I'll fill it. Yes. You have to believe that. You have to believe that as you go, as you say, I'm yielded to you, God. What do you want me to say? Who do you want me to go to? He's going to fill your mouth with the right things. Glory to God. Glory to God. You know, the thing that, that bothers me is, is that, that there are so many believers who who their parents, but what they do is they are, are not willing to accept the assignment that I've just told you about. And so consequently, they refuse to live a godly life in front of their children. You see, you're the example parents to your children. And so there are children who are raising themselves because they have no example, because parents have chosen their why, their purpose to go and do their job outside, not realizing their primary purpose is to be obedient to this word and to lead and guide and raise godly children so that their children hear the voice of God. Amen. And so, um, 
you have to make a determination that as I continue to go forth, as I continue to do what the God, God says, as I continue to do his work, guess what? He's going to take care of my business. When I'm doing his business, he's going to take care of my business. So in addition to having a why, in addition to having a purpose, you need to have a strong desire. See, there are lots of Christians who, who would quote what I just read, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Mark 16, 15 through 20. But let me tell you, if you were raised in the Baptist church, you memorized Matthew 28, 19 through 20, but that didn't mean you did it. Do you understand? You knew your why, you knew your purpose, but you didn't have the passion. You didn't have the desire. You didn't have the desire to fulfill that call. And so that's what we need to accompany our, our want to, our, we, our perseverance. We need to, our, our purpose. We need to have a strong desire. We need to have a strong desire. We need to have a want to. And if you don't have this, you won't complete your race. Paul had it, obviously. He had it. He was going to do whatever God called him to do. He was passionate. You see, I think people, especially men, they get passionate about football or sports, not anymore, but back then, passionate. Like that was all they talk about. But see, women talk about Pinterest and what's going on there. No, 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 no. We need to be passionate. There's nothing wrong with being a little bit passionate about sports, a little bit, I said, and a little bit about Pinterest, but we need to be passionate about the things of God. We need to be on fire. We need to have the zeal of God consume us with respect to the things of God because we don't have a whole lot of time left. We're in the last of the last days and we're believing for signs and wonders and miracles, but they're gonna flow through you. And that's why when we have our main thing, the main thing, going forth and telling people the good news about Jesus, yes, God knew you have to do the dishes, you have to vacuum the floor. Maybe mine, mine really needs vacuuming right now. But th nonetheless, there are things that you have to do in the natural, but you've got to have your main focus, your main purpose on the things of God. And then the Bible says, let's see, where is it in Psalm 37, 4, that as you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give give you the desires of your heart. So he causes that desire to rise up on the inside of you as you're submitted to him, as you're surrendered to him. Every day say, God, use me, lead me to the right people that I can talk to, that I can minister life today. But see, if you're so caught up in you and, and yourself and the things that you've got to do and your job and your kids and yes, you have to take care of your kids. Yes, you have to go to work, but I'm telling you, your main focus needs to be on God and his word. And when you do that, you're going to do better in your job. You're going to be a better mother or a father or a daughter or a son. You understand when you get your, your, your priorities correct, God changes your want to's as you're yielded to him and say, God, I want to serve you with my heart, soul, mind, and strength. God, I know that this is the life that you have for me. You know, when Jesus left, he said, look, greater works will you guys do because I go to the father. In other words, you are going to be my hands. You are going to be my voice in the earth today. Well, too many in the church today are just sitting sitting there, shut up. That's not going to work. That's not going to work. So what we have to do is we have to come out of ourselves. We have to develop, delight ourselves in the Lord. So that passion, that fire rises up on the inside of us and God will do that for you. God will do that for you. You know, there are people in the natural that have persevered. You know, I believe Jesus persevered, right? He went through all kinds of things. Paul persevered. You can go through other people in the Bible that they persevered. They didn't give up. They didn't quit. And some people in the natural that are persevering, think about Benjamin Franklin. You know, it took him 6,000 tries before he got it right on the light bulb. Glory to God. 6,000. He didn't quit. He persevered. He had a desire. He had a passion. I'm going to create a light bulb. 
That people can have lights, aren't we glad? We have lights in here today, glory to God. What about Walt Disney? You know, he didn't have a great life. He didn't really have a great life. In fact, you know, he had countless failures. He really did. He had an unhappy childhood. He didn't get along with his dad. He had um, one, he even went into bankruptcy. He had failure after failure after failure. They didn't want to, to, to promote his, his um, Mickey Mouse. First it was the rabbit and somebody stole that from him. You know, he, he had that nervous breakdown because he couldn't handle the pressure, you see? But what did he do? Did he let that stop him? All the failures he had, he just had perseverance. He continued to pursue. He continued to pursue. And, and what did he create? An empire that is worth today $150 billion. Now, he didn't have the Holy Ghost. We have the Holy Ghost. We have the Holy Ghost. We have the mind of Christ. You see, we can persevere to get this place turned right side up for the gospel of Jesus Christ because that's our mission. That's our mission. His goal was to make kids happy, to have a place where they could go. And he didn't even see Disney World before it was completed. But he had a passion. He had a dream. God has given us our dream to tell people the good news about Jesus because that's what, that's what he's waiting for. God is waiting for more people to come into the kingdom. Listen, we have a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Hell is not a pretty place. Too many people think hell is okay. It's party, party time, you know, sex, all this stuff. No, hell is burning. <laughs> Having worms eat you. Hell is hot. Hell is not the place that we want anybody to go. It wasn't made for, for people. It was made for the devil and his, his angels, you see? So we have a story to tell. We have a story to tell. That's our why. That's our purpose. And the word of God is our motivator to say, listen, don't keep it to yourself. And I believe, I truly believe in these last days, we're going we're gonna to have fire. We're going to have a passion for the lost. We're going to, to see people as God sees them. Not based on their outward appearance, not based on their stinking attitude or their stinking work ethic. We're going to see them as God sees them. And God is going to create in you a love for people. Instead of, I don't care if they all go to hell, I'm, I'm saved. You know, my family's saved. I don't care if they all go to hell. That's not the attitude that Jesus had. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Glory to God. So there are some opposites of perseverance that I want to mention to you quickly because sometimes you can understand a word by the opposite. And so the opposite of perseverance is apathy. Apathy. And on your handout, I have a place where you can check if you feel like you, ha you have any of these. If you've, before this day today, that you've been apathetic. The opposite of perseverance is apathy, indifference. Too many Christians are just indifferent. They have lethargy. They have fear. Weakness, laziness, disinterest. Disregard, indecisiveness, and boredom. The Word of God will eliminate these things because you make a decision July 7th, 2020, to persevere, to persevere. See, what you have to understand is that the enemy has an agenda, and his agenda is to wipe out the church. Yes, I understand that. But I just want to tell you a few things that, that I found that, that Lenin had written in 1921. Listen to this real quickly. Listen to this young people. His plan, and he was a socialist communist, his plan was to corrupt the young to corrupt the young. Get them away from religion. Get them interested in sex. Make them superficial. 
destroy their ruggedness. His plan was to get control of publicity. His plan was to divide the people into hostile groups, destroy people's faith in their leaders, preach true democracy, but seize power as fast and as ruthlessly as possible, produce fear, stir up unnecessary strikes, cause the registration of firearms on some pretext with a view of confiscating them and leaving the population defenseless. These are just a few of the things that were written in his manifesto. And the enemy will use people to like that to promote his agenda, the enemy's agenda. And that's what we're seeing in the world today. He's using yielded men who are worshipers of the devil to do these things on our country, to, to cause our youth to spend all their time on video games and no time in the word, to spend all their time on sex and thinking about sex and porn. You see, he wants to get to the children because he wants to steal their future, to steal their purpose. But I'm telling you, we have a weapon and that's perseverance. That's hupomene. That's standing. That's standing and not giving up. That's saying, I don't care what they say out there. I don't care about the pressure. I'm going to stand because I know I have the victory. I have the victory because God says I have the victory. I have faith in his word. I have faith in the spirit of God residing on the inside of me who is my helper and he will help you resist temptation. He will help you resist all these opposites of, of perseverance. He will help you. He will help you to have the fire of God on the inside of you because that's what God needs in these last days. The Bible says the former and the latter reign together. That's what we're ha it should be experiencing in these last days. The former was the day of Pentecost. The latter is what we as a body are going to rise up and stand, take a stand for right and truth to tell people the good news about Jesus, to live the overcoming life in front of them because we've got the power to believe the word of God on the inside of us. We've got endurance. We've got passion to do it. We will not be like those who are sitting back and saying, whatever will be, will be. God's going to take care of this mess. No, he's not. He's relying on us to take a stand to exercise our hupomene, our endurance, and say, no, I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand because I have a promise, right? We have a promise from Jesus himself who said in Matthew 16, 18b, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You have to believe that. You have to believe that because you are the church. Yes, collectively as a body, we're the church, but you are the church and God is building you. Are you allowing him to do that? Are you allowing him to do that?